សួស្ដីអ្នកទាំងអស់គ្នានៅក្នុងសេសសនីដែរយើងនឹងរៀនអំពីមេយ៉ាន្ថ្មីគឺតាក់ទងជាមួយនឹងការបង្កជំងឺ
Schistosomiasis is a tropical disease caused by a group of parasitic worms called schistosomes. These worms are also called blood flukes. The disease has affected people for thousands of years, and evidence of the disease has even been found in Egyptian mummies. Schistosomiasis is also known as Bilhartsia, named after Theodore Bilharts, who first described the parasite in humans. It's estimated that over 200 million people around the world are infected with these parasites. In sub-Saharan Africa alone, it causes over 200,000 deaths each year. Schistosomes have a very complex and interesting life cycle involving humans, snails, and fresh water such as lakes, ponds, and reservoirs. Five main types of schistosomes are responsible for most human disease. They differ in their distribution, the kind of disease they cause, and the type of snails that they live in. Hematobium is mostly found in parts of Africa and the Middle East and causes disease in the urinary and genital areas. Mansoni are mostly found in Africa, South America, and the Caribbean. Japonicum in parts of China and Southeast Asia, Mekongi in Cambodia and Laos, and Guinensis in Central Africa. These affect mainly the bowel and liver. Let's have a look at their life cycle. Infected humans pass schistosome eggs through their feces or urine into fresh water. These eggs then hatch into larvae and infect certain species of snails. After a period of development in the snail, they're released back into the water in a form called sicarii. The sicarii swim and penetrate the skin of a human and can enter the body of someone using the water. Once in the body, they find their way through the lungs and into the liver, where they grow into adult worms. They then migrate into blood vessels surrounding specific organs, where they can live for many years. Some species of schistoazoma like to live around the bowel, whereas other species prefer living around the bladder. These adults can lay thousands of eggs a day. Some of the eggs find their way back into the water through urine or feces and start the life cycle again, but some eggs get trapped in the organs. Schistosomiasis can cause both short-term and long-term disease. When the sicarii penetrate the skin, some people develop an itchy rash called swimmer's itch or fisherman's itch. Some people can develop a syndrome called acute schistosomiasis, also called Katayama fever. This occurs about four weeks after being exposed to the parasites for the first time. It usually presents with a fever and a range of other symptoms, such as diarrhea, rash, and respiratory symptoms. This is usually self-limiting. The long-term effects of schistosomiasis are more serious and occur as a result of the eggs that are trapped in various organs. The trapped eggs can lead to changes in tissues characterized by the formation of granulomas with a lot of inflammation around them. In the bladder, this can lead to hardening of the bladder wall, obstruction, and can even result in a type of bladder cancer. This can present with symptoms such as blood in the urine. Intestinal schistosomiasis can lead to symptoms such as abdominal pain, diarrhea, and blood in the stool. In the liver, the eggs can cause scarring of the tissues around the vessels of the liver, obstructing them, and can cause enlargements of the liver and spleen. Other organs that can be affected include the genital system, lungs, and sometimes even the brain. Chronic infection, especially in children, can lead to anemia. How is the disease diagnosed? Well, the disease can be diagnosed from the urine and stool using special techniques or by biopsy of tissues and examining it under the microscope. There are blood tests that can look for antibodies against the parasite. There is no vaccine against schistosomiasis yet, but there is effective medication to treat the disease. They usually work by killing the adult worms, which means that the eggs are no longer produced. Recovery of the affected organs depends on the type and extent of the damage that has already taken place. So how do we prevent the disease? Preventing the disease can occur at various points in the worm's life cycle. Remember the life cycle? The spread of schistosomiasis needs an infected human who contaminates the water, a snail, and subsequent contact with another human who uses the contaminated water. The disease can be eliminated in humans using medication. In areas that have a lot of disease, entire communities or targeted at-risk groups can be treated with medication to reduce the incidence of disease. Large-scale drug treatment has been an effective way to control schistosomiasis. Another approach is to reduce the contamination of water. This involves activities such as educating people on proper sanitation and providing necessary facilities such as toilets. 
Some countries have tried to eliminate snails by using chemicals or biological control methods. Their effectiveness has been variable. The other way to prevent the transmission of disease is through reducing contact with contaminated water. Tourists can be advised not to swim or wade in areas that are known to have schistosomiasis. However, avoiding water can be hard to do for people who live near water and depend on it for their livelihood or for basic functions. Providing clean water sources for drinking, cooking, or washing clothes can reduce contact with contaminated water. Hello, and welcome to this video where we'll be taking a look at soil transmitted helminths. Like the name suggests, soil transmitted helminths are a group of parasitic worms or helminths that are transmitted through soil that's been contaminated with their eggs. These infections are very common. It mainly affects poor and disadvantaged communities around the world. It's estimated that over 1.5 billion people in the world are infected with these worms. That's almost a quarter of the world's population. Most of these infections occur in tropical and subtropical countries. They're commonly seen in areas where there's warm and moist climate and there's poor sanitation and hygiene. Although there are many different species of helminths, we'll focus on the three main types that cause infections in humans. These are roundworms, Ascaris lumbricoides, whipworms, Trichurius trichuria, and hookworms, Nicator americanus and Ancelostoma duodenale. They vary in the type of illness they cause and their life cycle. Soil transmitted helminths are transmitted by eggs that are passed in the feces of people who are infected. The soil can be contaminated by feces in areas where there's poor sanitation and people defecate outside or when human feces is used as fertilizer. Once they're in the soil, roundworm and whipworm eggs mature into an infective form. This can take a few weeks. Hookworm eggs, on the other hand, mature and hatch into larvae that have the ability to penetrate skin. A person can be infected in several different ways. It can enter through the mouth. This can happen when food such as vegetables are contaminated with eggs and are not cooked or washed before eating. When water is contaminated. When people's hands are contaminated by the soil and not washed before eating. Hookworm larvae have the ability to penetrate the skin of people. People usually get infected when they're walking barefoot. Very rarely some types of hookworm larvae can get into the body when they're consumed. Now, once they enter the body, they eventually make their way to the small or large intestine where they live and grow. But they have slightly different ways of getting there. Hookworm larvae that penetrate the skin are carried through the blood into the heart and lungs and eventually make their way to the small intestine. Roundworm eggs that are swallowed hatch into larvae, enter the blood, make a trip via the heart and lungs and eventually make their way to the small intestine. Whipworm eggs, on the other hand, hatch into larvae and make their way directly to the large intestine. Once in their final destinations, they attach to the wall of the intestine, grow, mature, and can live there for many years. 
They also produce thousands of eggs per day, which are then passed out in the feces to start the cycle of infection again. People can be infected with more than one type of worm at the same time. So, how does this disease present? Well, the symptoms will depend on the type of worm and the number of worms that are living in the intestine. People with very few worms may have no symptoms at all. On the other hand, people with a lot of worms can have a range of symptoms. What happens in the intestine is that these worms can feed on tissues, blood, or nutrients. There can also be blood loss and inflammation at the sites where the worms attach. The chronic blood loss leads to anemia. The loss of protein and reduced absorption of nutrients can lead to nutritional impairment and malnutrition. When these happen over a long period of time, it can lead to impaired physical and mental development, especially in children. This can in turn lead to poor school performance and reduce future economic productivity. Other symptoms include diarrhea and abdominal pain, malaise, weakness, and loss of appetite. With hookworm infections, there could be skin irritation where the hookworm larvae enter the body. And sometimes, people present with respiratory symptoms when the worms travel through the lungs. Heavy infections can lead to bowel obstruction, which can be life-threatening. Whipworm infections can lead to rectal prolapse. Sometimes the worms can migrate and cause disease in other parts of the body, like the bile ducts and nasal sinuses. Infections are usually diagnosed by looking at stool samples under the microscope and identifying eggs. Sometimes worms can be passed in feces and are large enough to be seen. Worms such as Ascaris can grow up to 35 centimeters long. So how do we treat these infections? There is very effective anti-helminthic medication to treat infections. When there's bowel obstruction or prolapse, surgery is sometimes needed. Let's talk about prevention. Over the years, there have been sustained control programs that have been led by the World Health Organization, national governments, and with the help of others such as non-governmental organizations and pharmaceutical companies. The best long-term strategies to prevent soil-transmitted helminth infections are having clean and uncontaminated water supplies and improving sanitation, such as providing appropriate toilets and effective sewage disposal systems. Hygiene practices such as hand washing, washing food and not walking barefoot will also prevent people from being infected. In parts of the world where there are difficulties in implementing effective and large-scale improvements in water and sanitation, periodic mass drug administration, also called deworming, for at-risk people has been very effective. This can reduce the burden of disease and subsequently the consequence of infections. At-risk people include preschool and school-aged children and women of childbearing age. People in certain jobs such as tea pickers or miners are also at high risk of infection. Deworming is usually done once or twice a year depending on how common the disease is in those communities. Although there's research into developing a human vaccine, there is no effective vaccine on the market yet. And that's a quick look at soil-transmitted helminths. For more information, have a look at the websites below.